Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the public webinar, Art as Research, Microhistory as Method. Uh, my name is Pamela Corey, and I'm a faculty member at Fulbright University, Vietnam. And I'm delighted to be uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming you to this event um, alongside my colleague, uh, Bill Nguyen. And so um, let me tell you a little bit about the broader program that this webinar is a part of. So called the Science of Real Life by historians Carlo Ginsberg and Carlo Pony, Microhistory describes an approach to studying history that employs what we could think of as a microscopic lens, focusing on seemingly irrelevant details, habits, and routines, <coughs> and underlying mentalities. Such studies can serve as histories from below, giving voice and representation to subjects made silent or abstract in prevailing master narratives. This public program, comprising a seminar, film screening, and workshop, explores the interdisciplinary potential of microhistory, bringing together artistic practice, history, art history, and anthropology as research-based forms of critical and creative inquiry. I'd like to add that this program is part of an inter-institutional research exchange between Fulbright University of Vietnam and Konstfak University of Arts, Craft, and Design, funded by a Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education Mobility Grant for Internationalization. It also joins the educational programming for Illuminated Curiosities, an exhibition presented by the Nguyen Art Foundation. And I'd like to um, have my colleague, uh, Bill Nguyen, who is director of the Nguyen Art Foundation, um, share a little bit more about Illuminated Curiosities. Thank you, Pamela, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Nguyen, and I am director of Nguyen Art Foundation. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude towards Pamela and Fulbright for this wonderful opportunity to continue our collaboration. Uh, thank you to the participating speakers and to those who've tuned in to be with us this evening. So you might have heard about the work that we do at Win Art Foundation. Uh, for those who haven't, the Foundation's mission is twofold. One, to collect and preserve artworks of high criticality and significance throughout the different eras of Vietnamese art and to share them with our public. And number two, to strengthen the scholarship, discussion, study, and appreciation of arts through our exhibitions, education and public programs, and development projects, and to continue the writing of the next chapters of our art history. Tonight's event thus expands a segment of idea and an area of artistic interrogation that is present in our current exhibition, Illuminated Curiosities, which is curated by Ace Le and Zhang Mek Hong, with the assistance of Nguyen Thang Ming Tam, one of Fulbright's homegrown talents. Featuring artworks from both in and out of our collection, the exhibition aims to look at the intersection between artistic research and production and other disciplines, history included. The participating artists in this exhibition return us to some of the most fundamental questions. What is history? Which history do we choose to tell and retell? Where to look for other histories? And for whom are such histories created? I hope in today's talk, we can further unpack these questions through the practices of Mart and Magnus. I will now leave the floor to Pamela, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce our three speakers. Um, our first presenter will be uh, Dr. Mark Frank, who is an assistant professor of history and the coordinator of the history major at Fulbright University, Vietnam. He has published several articles about the Sino-Tibetan borderlands, including microhistories of Chinese weather stations and experimental farms on the Tibetan plateau in the early 20th century. His book in progress, The Rooted State, Plants and Power on the Chinese Frontier, shows how ideas about agrarian colonization traveled between different settings on the Chinese frontier during the Republican era, when the state itself was deeply fractious. 
It combines micro and macro perspectives to illustrate that the experiences of individuals and communities often reverberated with those of distant strangers in surprising ways. Our second speaker will be Magnus Vartos, who is a professor of fine arts and head of research at Konstvak University of Arts, Crafts and Design in Stockholm, Sweden. He works foremost with text in film, essay and assemblage or installation. His works have been exhibited at Moderna Museum in Stockholm in 1990, 2006 and 2010. And he is the winner of the grand prize at Oberhausen International Film Festival in 2010. He also participated in Platform 2009 in Seoul, the ninth Guangzhou Biennial in 2012 and the Real DMZ at Art Sonje in Seoul in 2013 and 2015. Gothenburg Konsthal presented a larger retrospective exhibition of his work in 2016. His book, All Monsters Must Die, together with Frederick Ekman, was shortlisted for the Swedish National August Prize in 2011. And finally, um, our respondent, Dr. Nora Annesley Taylor, is uh, currently the Alsdorf Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she's also currently interim provost at Fulbright University, Vietnam. She received her PhD from Cornell University, and she's the author of Painters in Hanoi, an ethnography of Vietnamese art published by Hawaii Press in 2004 and reprinted by National University of Singapore Press in 2009. She is also the co-editor of Modern and Contemporary Southeast Asian Art, an anthology by Cornell Southeast Asia Programs Press in 2012, as well as numerous articles on modern and contemporary Southeast Asian and Vietnamese art. In 2014, she was the recipient of a John Solomon Guggenheim Fellowship for a study on the politics of performance art in Southeast Asia. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand the floor to um, Dr. Bartolas. So, um, oh no, sorry, <laughs> Professor Mark Frank. So please um, go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Pamela. Um, it's really a privilege to be invited to this event and to get to talk with Magnus and Nora. Um, I'm gonna try to share my slides now. Um, let's see here. Hmm. Okay, I think I've got it. Okay, um, can somebody let me know verbally if you can see my slides full screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think that often um, um, the humanities, scholarship in the humanities is most productive when people take something from one discipline and uh, experiment with it uh, in a different discipline. Um, and that's true of, of historians taking things from other disciplines and of other people taking ideas from historians. Um, and it's true of microhistory. So today, um, I'm not here to tell anyone how they should do microhistory um, or to be a gatekeeper, but rather to describe uh, what it has been in the past and how people have done it, including my own attempts at microhistory. Um, very few people are professional microhistorians. Um, I think the golden age of microhistory was probably in the 1970s and 80s in the field of history. Rather, it's something that it's sort of a method, um, an approach to doing history that lots of different people can um, can attempt and can set aside when they're done with it. Um, so. Um, historians like to talk about archives. Historians do research at the archives. And, um, uh, you know, archives contain unpublished material um, that let us write stories that nobody has ever heard. Um, and so um, when I talk to people about microhistory, I like to tell them that um, if you reach into your pockets, um, there might be an archive in your pocket or in your purse or in your backpack, or your trash can, or your desk drawer. Um, it's not, it's not a, an archive that's organized or um, curated, um, but it could be. And so I, I, as an experiment yesterday, looked through my pockets and um, my surroundings 
And here's what I came up with. Um, if you were to take these things that were in my pockets and uh, lying around my desk, um, you could start to put together a basic story about what I've been doing and where I've been recently. Um, there are uh, documents here from four different countries, um, four different languages. Um, some of them have dates and the names of places on them. Um, and so you could at least develop a theory of uh, what I've been doing using these. And so this would be very different from what most historians do most of the time. Historians tend to be big picture thinkers and not, um, and, and not think in terms of a single life. Um, and traditionally, um, the practice of, of modern history, the practice as in the modern practice of history, uh, as Jeremy Edelman says, centered on and was dominated by the nation state. So most history was the history of the nation, not the history of a person or a few people. Um, and archives tend to focus on national documents, documents of importance to the nation and its subunits, including provinces, states, cities, and so on. But in the late 20th century, there was a reaction to this, people trying to do something different. And the results were, among other things, the field of global history, people trying to write um, histories beyond above the scale of the nation. And here are just a couple of well-known examples. And on the opposite extreme of the scale, uh, micro histories. And here are a few of my favorite micro histories. Um, unlike global histories, which think on the largest possible terrestrial scale, uh, micro histories tend to think on just about the smallest possible scale. A very simple definition of micro history is uh, history on a small scale. Um, but as I'm, I'm going to explain today, um, that's not really all it is. It's not just history on a small scale. There's a little bit more to it. Um, both global histor both global histories and micro histories um, often describe themselves as a response to the national history, um, which has, as we said, been the dominant form of historiography uh, until quite recently. Um, and when I I, I, I do a micro history session uh, for our Fulbright undergrads in global in Fulbright History Lab, and to explain what it is, I try to explain what it's not. Um, so these are the things that micro history usually is not. They're quite similar, but they're different. Um, so there are narrative history and historical fiction. Um, these are genres of history um, that are designed to entertain above all else, and they can be great. Um, so I recently read a book called uh, The Devil in the White City about a serial killer in Chicago during the 19th century. Um, and it, it, it's a really fun book, um, but its primary aim is to entertain and it takes liberties with the record, with the archival record that most academic historians would not. Um, some would say it's, it's dis distorted and inaccurate in significant ways because it, it aims to entertain. Um, there's also serious biography, um, the history of a single person like Winston Churchill or um, or Ho Chi Minh, and um, and this is this can be quite similar to microhistory, but the difference is that biographies tend to be biographies of well-known people, people who are particularly important to the world. Um, they're histories from above most of the time. Microhistory is usually history from below, histories of people nobody ever talked about until somebody came along and wrote a history of them. Um, Microhistory is also a response to something called social history that became popular in the 1970s, maybe a little bit earlier. Social history is the, the history of ordinary people. The difference between microhistory and social history is that social history tends to deal with the people or society writ large. Um, it's, it's still history on a big scale, and it relies on a lot of quantification and abstraction of the people. But as microhistorians will point out, um, there is no the people um, when you look closely at the record. Um, people are individuals, and uh, people have individual cultures. So do families and, and uh, small communities. Um, and so I think microhistory is probably 
closer to the genre of ethnography than any of these. Um, and it, it takes inspiration from ethnography in anthropology. Um, some people would describe it as the anthropology of, um, or, or as, as a form of historical anthropology. The major difference being that it, it draws mostly on documents. Um, so it tends to rely on documents. It tends to um, look small and think big. So it's small in scope, but it draws big uh, conclusions about the way that people are and interact. Um, it's often enjoyable, and it often describes the author's discovery of the sources and engagement with the sources. So the author is often pr present in the microhistory, which is pretty different from a lot of other historical genres. Um, one of the first self-described microhistories is this book, Pickett's Charge, from 1959 by uh, historian George Stewart. But as the microhistorian uh, Carlo Ginsberg explains, this isn't really microhistory the way that we understand it now. It's the history of about 20 minutes in one battle in the American Civil War that, according to the author, helped to determine the fate of the United States and thus the fate of World War II and the fate of the world. Um, it, it tries to take a small event and argue that it determined the history of the world. But his, again, microhistory tends to be, the way that we understand it now, it tends to be history from below. Um, it, microhistory, the way that we practice it now, is the history of um, people who aren't particularly important and events that aren't particularly influential, and yet they shed light on the way that people are and, um, and, and the way that they think and interact with each other. Um, so well-known microhistorian Carlo Ginsberg says that today historians are no longer only interested in the great deeds of kings, and you could say presidents and, and politicians. Um, so uh, I'll skip this one. To, um, to explain how it works, I like to tell my students to imagine a lens. And we've got a, a lens that's a very small object, um, but it refracted in that lens is something much larger. But the lens allows us to see that larger picture in a different way, such as in this image of a house inverted and somewhat distorted um, in a small lens. Um, and we, we, we do that by looking at untraditional sources, so sources that you might not find except by accident. Uh, and oftentimes, microhistorians describe finding their sources by accident while they're looking for something else. And that was certainly my experience. Um, so I want to just talk very briefly about um, the history, what, what I've seen in terms of the combination of art and microhistory. Um, so uh, there are a lot of graphic um, histories that uh, historians use to teach and, 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 and that historians just enjoy reading, including um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, um, Jean Lin Yang's Boxers and Saints and T-Boy's The Best We Could Do. I've taught with Boxers and Saints and The Best We Could Do and students love them. Um, I think multiple Fulbright classes use T-Boy's book. Um, these three are volumes by people who are illustrators who are also writers, but they're not academic historians. Uh, and yet, you know, these are great books. Um, Oxford University Press recently took inspiration from these and others and, and created its own graphic history series. Um, and in all of these books, an illustrator named Liz Clark works with um, academic historians to create uh, basically graphic monographs. They're works of original res research that are illustrated. Um, so these are collaborations between artists and Illustrate an illustrator, um, and uh, the Great Hanoi Rat Hunt is a, a good Vietnam history that I've used to teach, um, and I, I like it a lot. It, it tends to be popular with historians. I'm not sure how it's received in the art community, um, but I, I I really like these. And and so when I wrote my last uh, article, which is a micro history of a Chinese weather station in Tibet, um, I I came across these sources again by accident while looking for something else. I was looking for um, documentation about the weather in Tibet and came across personal accounts of weather observers, most of whom were suffering badly in the cold and with loneliness and poverty and, and so on. Um, and so I decided to work with an illustrator named Lodan Rojas, and I, I gave her both documents and some historical visual materials. And she produced, um, this is my rough sketch, and this is her much nicer um, illustration that was one of two illustrations that went into my published article. And I, I love these. Um, you know, um, I had to pay out of pocket for my illustrations, for her illustrations, but um, 
I just think they really brighten the piece and bring it to life. Um, so I guess my questions for, as, as a historian, I'm very open to other ways of engaging with the art community. You know, I understand that hiring an illustrator is far from the only possibility. Um, so I wonder whether visual art can be a medium rather than a visual aid for doing microhistory, and if so, what would that look like? And I've, I've gotten an idea by looking at Magnus's work uh, online, but I'd like to hear more about that. Um, I'd also like to know whether artists other than illustrators would like to work with historians, whether there's a desire for that, and, and if so, how? Um, and uh, how can we do interdisciplinary microhistory without losing what makes it distinctive? So I, I think as a historian, the one thing that I would worry about is that it would just be become uh, the history of, or, you know, so it would just become sort of uh, personal accounts, but without the sort of bigger picture. And finally, um, this is a, just something I've been thinking about recently. Uh, what do we do about AI generated art, text art? Um, so this is um, intriguing to me as a historian because the ability to convert text to a visualization instantly um, is really powerful for teaching, possibly for um, bringing my work or or the documentary record to life, and, and just for thinking about um, thinking about the past. But at the same time, I'm sensitive to the ethical issues surrounding AI-generated art, including the fact that it draws on human-generated art without citing it. Um, and you know, the same thing could easily happen to historians, it could be that um, AI will generate historical writing someday. Um, but uh, in closing, um, there are certainly cases in which um, art provides the inspiration or the basis for academic conventional microhistory. Uh, and in, in this case, um, the French film, Le Retour de, The Return of Martin Guerre, Le Retour de Martin Guerre, um, the, one of the consultants, the historical consultant for the 1982 film, Natalie Zimon Davis, who's a Canadian-American author, proceeded after the film to um, turn her research into a book, The Return of Martin Guerre. I didn't realize there was a film until recently because this book is so well-received um, in the historical community. Um, but I see this as a very fruitful collaboration between uh, art broadly defined and academic history. Okay. Um, I hope I haven't gone too far over time. Let me see. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and, get, and let uh, Magnus take over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. That was really super interesting and um, so clear and accessible. And um, I love that you presented some um, avenues, some clear avenues to Magnus's presentation. Um, so on that note, I'd like to hand things over to uh, Professor Bartos. Yes, thank you, Pamela. And thank you, Mark, for that great introduction. It was very helpful, um, very enlightening, and, and great examples, I would say. So I will share screen now. And please tell me if it works. Are we good there? Yes. Fine, thank you. So, so I, I want to share with you some of the experience of, of running a research product at Konstfak in Stockholm a couple of years ago. Um, this, this was a project funded by the Swedish Re Research Council. So the idea was to gather knowledge from artistic practice and artistic research and the field of history. So that resulted in a in, in number of artworks, screenings, seminars, and an anthology, you should see here. And I will tell a little bit more about uh, what happened in this project and some of the questions we encountered. And Carl Ginsberg has been mentioned. He is father of, of history, although he wouldn't like that term. Or South. But as a part of our research, we went to see um, We wanted to also understand more about the context of the truth. 
sorry, sorry to interrupt, Magnus. Uh, we're getting a lot of static. It sounds like something's moving against the microphone, maybe. Oh, now it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Is it better? Yes. Did you hear me? Did I? Should I repeat something, maybe? Maybe just repeat the last uh, minute. Yeah. Okay. So we went to Bologna to talk to to Carl Ginsberg. Mark has, in a way, introduced him already, um, because he is such an important figure in, in this field. And we wanted to understand the context of his, his work uh, from the 70s. And, and he spoke about um, uh, how this was, has to be understood in the context of, of decolonization, student protest, and increasingly strong criticism towards some of the supposedly Western values at the time, development, progress, and modernity. So he and his colleagues, they turned the spotlight towards the Middle Ages, basically, and the early modern area rather than modernity. Um, they turned towards the elusive rather than tangible. And towards the exception rather than the rule, and especially the everyday normal exception, as they call it. And this, in this context, uh, it's interesting to look at the book that Mark introduced, The Cheese and the Worms. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the content because it's interesting to understand perhaps from, from that book uh, something very important about the method. And it's, in a way, a biography, and Mark already mentioned that biography has a very important role in microhistory. But we can speak about a biography of an unknown person. Um, for myself, regarding my own practice, I've been very occupied the meaning, uh, by the meaning of biographies and then work with that genre in different ways. So. The book is about Menocchio. He is a miller. He's running a mill, and he would then meet people you know, from very different social strata. You know, he would he would talk to peasants and to bourgeoisie people. Uh, and Menocchio, he has a very strange ideas. He has his own strange cosmology that he is sharing with his customers, um, and that cosmos was in his way of thinking, in his fantasy, um, created from the beginning in the same way as cheese arises from milk. So in this mass, worms showed up that appeared to be angels. Um, so you can understand that this was not uh, very popular um, by the Catholic Church at the time. The, the miller was worn by the church for his blasphemous ideas for, for heresy. But um, for, for Menocchio, the miller, it was perhaps too compelling and too sensational what he has discovered. So he couldn't help. Um, he promised to get better. He was warned by the church, but he couldn't keep his promise. He was executed by the Inquisition. Um, so, Karl Ginsberg been working a lot with opening up the Catholic Inquisition archives, for instance. But the major question that Ginsberg asks here is, well, it's a fantastic story in a way, and it's very also entertaining to read this book. Um, but the really important question is, how was Menocchio able to think like this in a period of this time? And where did his ideas come from? So there is a question about marginality and deviation, and an idea that this study would be as important as trying to understand and describe as the dominating ideas of that period of time. So what we did in this project is that we we wanted to investigate how kind of mutual exchange would come about between 
this approach used in microhistory and visual art, especially one genre, the video essay. And the reason why we turn to the video essay, well, there are several reasons. One is that my own dissertation is partly about video essay. Um, but we thought there was something of a very strong resonance in terms of methodology. Uh, for instance, if we, we, we look into the work, just to give an example of, of German filmmaker Harun Farocki, uh, he speaks about how to reclaim a text from images and how to speak and listen to images. And there's a very strong resonance to microhistory when you see how he works with details and how the, these details can be connected to larger courses of events. We formed a group of artists, curators, theoreticians, and our discussion and works came to focus um, very much about the very process of history writing and how to narrate or visualize history. But often very much about, you know, we focus on the moment when something becomes history. Um, so we launched our product at CONSFAC, and here you see Michel Turan giving a lecture performance. He's doing a sort of mapping of people in Berlin um, using their postings on YouTube. So she's figuring out where they live, and there's a map of, of Berlin in that sense, and she would then follow them each of them. So she carefully watched every video published by her protagonist um, and mapping the places in the city. And she combines and collects stories. She's acting almost like a stalker in this project. Here we see, for instance, a Polish guest worker painting apartments, smoking, and the pensioner Mane, who is uh, often most involved in chatting with his wife. We made screenings with the creative programs. This one is from Moderna Museet in Stockholm. And um, in our team, we had to the left, Besad Khosravi Nori and Pilos Kantari, two Iranian filmmakers. Here we have a talk with Susanna Milevska, who is a curator from Macedonia. Um, and that was interesting to, to, to compare different geographies in this project. Um, for instance, um, Bestad has a collection of films from um, private archives in, in Tehran. Um, there's a whole moment of filmmakers in Iran who cannot show the films in, in movie theaters because of censorship. So they have a whole system, self-organized system of, of showing them in private. And really, when you look into this archive, you see how many of these works are, have a micro-historical approach. And, and Peter Scalantari in the, meter, in the middle, he was really adopting the term microhistory micro in his work. And today he has a kind of microhistorical school in, in Tehran. We also made a field trip to Skopje, and the capital of Macedonia, or rather North Macedonia, which is now the official name. There's been a lot of conflict around the naming, as you might know, in this area. Um, so Susanna Mlevska is, is living there. And, and um, this city became a very interesting case study in our product um, because the, the government has placed those extremely large scale monuments in the city, which somehow in a very violent way forces grand memories and grand narratives on the citizens. Here you see, for instance, how they would cover um, uh, 
the brutalist architecture from the socialist time of Yugoslavia with these neo fake neoclassicist facades. There's only one of all these monuments in the center of the city who is depicting a woman, and that is Alexander the Great's mother in three different phases of the childhood of Alexander the Great. So there's very little space, according to Susanna Milevska, for, for artists or architect, architects and researchers in Macedonia for doing microhistory in this context. Because everything is here about the grand, spectacular history and this huge reclaim of the heritage of Alexander the Great. So this become, became almost like a counter um, uh, pole to what we were doing in our project. As a practice-based uh, research project, it was of very great importance for us to, to fund, um, discuss and promote the making of the artworks within the project. And these are examples um, by Lina Selander installation at the Venice Biennial. She made four films actually during the three years. She was very productive. Um, so she showed her works at the Venice Biennial for the Swedish pavilion at the time. I did two works by myself. Um, one is made for an institution called Tensta Konstal, which is the northern suburb of, of Stockholm. Um, so it's called The Miracle of Tensta, um, that is English title. So what happened was that um, this is based on a spe specific event, 2012, when a young girl borrowed her mother's smartphone and took a photo of a very peculiar cloud in the sky. And she showed it to her mother, and the mother was very convinced that this was an operation of, of the Holy Mary. And this image started to circulate on social media, and then led to a lot of people gathering in Tiansta, in the local Syrian Orthodox Church, convinced that there would be more miracles. And once again it happened, um, the shape of a face appeared on the windows of the church in the condensation. So my film um, consists of a stage reading of a manuscript made of discussion threads on the internet. Because the major newspaper in Sweden, they actually wrote an article about this event, but then it very quickly disappeared from the public discussion. Uh, and the public debate really couldn't handle this sort of uh, ecstatic religiosity. Um, and this was actually the interesting part for me in the context of microhistory, that, that one group of people, um, the Syrian Orthodox Church, uh, officially wrote this event into the history of miracles of their church. They took a decision. Um, but in Sweden, it became a very marginal event. It is not even mentioned in the history of Sweden. So in the majority society, this history was expelled, if you like, or, or, or was never mentioned again after this event. Um, the other film is um, a sort of biographical film, and that is about a person in Tokyo who calls himself the last Jew of Tokyo. He is a Japanese citizen. His family has been there for three, at least three generations. And his name is Johnny Walker, um, but he calls himself Johnny Walker. He's a quite famous character in, in, in the Japanese art scene. He's also... His name is also a character in Haruki Murakami novel. And Johnny Walker is very pleased with this coincidence and claims that Murakami has modeled 
the character in the book on him. And he also claims that he is the only left, the only Jew left in Japan, descending from the old Jewish families that have stayed in the country for more than three generations. Um, so through um, this biography of Johnny, I try to understand something about the history of the Jews in Japan in a way. Microhistory, um, I'm going to mention also, I, I will show, if for those of you who are interested to see these films, they are actually available on my, my webpage, and I will share that with you later on. Microhistory, after this research project, um, which resulted in these artworks and this anthology, we, we started an independent course at Konstwerk. Um, um, so, in this course, we run it for the third year now. Students come from very different disciplines, from journalists, from, from writing, from crafts, art and design. And I think we discovered that it's been very um, fruitful to organize your own work um, according to some kind of microhistorical uh, model that you start with a detail, and from that detail you unfold larger courses of events. This is an exhibition we made from one of the year's exam work in the course. In the, you see here, for instance, um, a designed archive for an um, image archive from a porcelain factory. Just to give one example of the student works, so you know a little bit how how they would work within the course. Um, if we have time, do we have time? Or because I'm yes. just about to yes, we have time. So, in in the Swedish regular apartment area, you would find this kind of freestanding metal construction. Um, it's not far back in history. The tenants used that for whipping carpets. But today, no one is using that object anymore. It has become a, a kind of obsolete uh, sculpture outside the, in, in the common space of between the houses. Sometimes maybe children use it for, for playing or climbing but most often it's just empty around this place. Um, so the student made an um, investigation about this object um, and, and the history, the meaning involving questions around, and unfolding questions around housing, hygiene, women's household work, some questions around the public space, and also the very aesthetics of the object and the student work with text, sound, photography, drawing. This is a whipping, very typical pattern of a whipping object to use. Um, so that was just one of the many examples of, 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 of student works in the course. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to also have a workshop here in, in Oshima City on, on, on Sunday to try to, to discuss these possibilities of, of unfolding from the start of a detail. Yeah, I'm, I'm done with my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing if I manage. This is my web page, by the way. All right, terrific. Thank you so much, Magnus. And uh, we will now welcome a response from Professor Nora Taylor. Um, I just wanted to mention that if there are any questions from our viewers, you can type your questions into the chat box on Facebook and they'll get to our speakers that way. Um, so over to you, Nora. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to partake in this 
great event and I'm uh, learning a lot already and I'm very pleased to hear more about uh, Mark and Magnus's work um, that I hadn't been familiar with. So I want to start uh, actually a few th with a few things. First of all, Mark, thank you for um, helping to explain to the audience what microhistory is and giving an example of your own work, but also ending your presentation with questions. And so I'm going to actually start with those questions uh, in a little bit. And Magnus, uh, in a way, your uh, uh, presentation about your own work answered some of Mark's questions. <laughs> so one of the questions that Mark has asked is sort of how do uh, how does visual art kind of serve as a medium or a, a method for microhistory? And so um, I feel that your you know the, the the examples that you gave Magnus of your own works are a great starting point for answering that question. So in order to kind of unpack a little bit about some of the these questions that Mark asked. I wanted to talk about some of the examples that he gave and then um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, throw them back at both of you. So, for instance, Mark, you talked about graphic novels as a kind of art and history in one, uh, a way of writing a history through art in some way. Now, of course, I'm an art historian. <laughs> so. There's also this question, you didn't mention art history, but of whether us art historians, we are historians of some kind, uh, do we do micro histories as well? And of course, I would say we do. Uh, all of us are historians of geographical, geographically underrepresented regions, such as myself uh, having or people claim that I was the first academic uh, art historian of Vietnam, for instance, so was I doing a microhistory? Or um, I hadn't thought of that term when I was doing it. Um, but there are, of course, there are scholars today that work on Palestine or um, you know, Brazil or some places that are less associated with art. Well, Brazil is not a good example, but Palestine is actually a really interesting example of that. Um, lesser represented um, art historical narrative, let's say. And I once attended a conference in which the scholar Kirsten Scheid presented a, a paper on Picasso in Palestine where she talked about an actual Picasso painting coming to Palestine and being presented and exhibited there. And it made me think about micro I thought of that example and thinking about micro history because you spoke about, um, or one of you spoke about detail or a lens, you know, or something that a small lens. So a very small incident um, of a Picasso arriving in Palestine is actually very generative of all kinds of questions or issues that we may that may arise. With those, just the title of it already would trigger some all kinds of questions on the part of of of, of a person, or uh, certainly sets uh, in motion a set of inquiries. Uh, who who saw that work? You know why was it there? Um, you know what was it doing? How did it get there? And it, and you're interested in borders. Actually, one of the main analyses that she did was how it actually crossed the border and uh, into Gaza. So those are uh, examples. And um, so you asked also about um, sort of do artists want to work with historians? which was also a really interesting question because um, Pamela and I know uh, ex examples of artists as such as Tiffany Chung, who worked with Eric Harms. But there's also uh, a famous essay by Mark Godfrey called The Artist as Historian that says it's not so much that artists are working with historians, but artists are, are historians. So this is different from art history where we scholars are... Um, 
uh, doing histories through art and using artists as examples of histories, or we are trying to contextualize certain artworks within a history or historical narrative that could be seen as a micro history, of course. Um, but the artist who is a historian uh, is interesting. You have an example. This is Pamela has also spoken about this uh, artist, Fan Tao Nguyen, who has, through her artwork, um, retrieved or excavated moments in history that had been overlooked or ignored and then makes a film and uses a kind of um, poetic license to um, generate images um, and ask a series of questions. She doesn't claim to be a historian, but obviously by, by taking that hist historical material, I would say that she's using archival material, a photograph that she found in the archive or a text and then pursuing it as, as research, and then making an artwork based on that. And I've been writing and researching the Danish uh, Vietnamese artist Zan Va, who also finds, buys, purchases, collects historical objects. And I've been trying to try to make sense of why and how he uses those objects and how they generate narratives that the artist is not producing those narratives. It's just merely that he's bringing out a letter signed by Henry Kissinger. And then he's calling on the audience to kind of generate that kind of history or uh, not history, but a narrative. So that's slightly different. You mentioned also, both of you mentioned stories, narratives, and then Magnus also talked about detail. And I was reminded of a book that I once read by Naomi Shore called Reading in Detail. And she uses a few artworks in, as examples where she zooms in on details of particular artworks and reading them uh, as, as evidence of femininity, of uh, aesthetics. Um, I, I don't recall all of the details, but I do know that it was, I was captivated by this idea that this was a different way of reading a painting, which of course we art historians do all the time, but just the word detail. So that means that, and I, I think about that with Zen Val too, it's kind of one little item generates a, a bigger. So a micro generates a macro story. So, you know, these are some thoughts that I had as you were uh, speaking. And, um, oh, and, and Magnus also, thank you for, for your work. One, uh, these are really, I, I can't wait to look them up some more. But when you talk about obsolete objects, I was also reminded of, um, uh, a class that actually is taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago is very famous. It's called Abandoned Practices. It's a performance art class. And students are to research an obsolete object or a mechanism or a story or something that is no longer in practice, no longer used, and create an artwork based on it. And I've attended some of the final projects that the students have made, and it's fascinating. They've done things like uh, the one I attended, the students had researched the pneumatic, if you remember, that people sent mail and tubes and, you know, air projected. And they made a fascinating, absolutely fascinating project based on this idea. So, so to answer some of your questions, Mark, you know, about what, you know, how do artists generate, you know, micro histories? These are some examples, I think. So my question to both of you then is one that goes back to something that Mark uh, brought up too, which is thinking about microhistory as method. But I would like you to elaborate a bit more, like what is your method? Um, you said something about chance and counters, something, Mark, but both of you, um, maybe one at a time or whoever wants to go first, uh, I would be interested in hearing um, what your methods are. If, I'm sorry if that's too vague, but choose to answer it whichever way you want. Uh, 
Um, I could go first. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. And I, I'm really interested in hearing about Magnus's methods, especially after seeing your presentation. I'd, I'd like to hear about how films like uh, The Strangest Stranger were made. Um, but I, I can uh, briefly describe. Um, OK, so I um, in, in The Cheese and the Worms, to come back to that, uh, Ginsburg describes very clearly his method and how the book came together. Um, and he was writing a book on witchcraft and on the Inquisition, as in the Catholic Inquisition into witchcraft, um, and kind of looking at that systematically. When he came across this one trial record that was just bonkers about um, this miller named Minocchio, which is uh, which Magnus described really well. So I won't describe it again, but yeah, Minocchio has his own view of the universe, his own cosmology, his own cosmology um, that it, it combines. It seems to combine Christian and and possibly Islamic and pagan and other ideas, um, and it gets him killed in the end. And uh, Ginsburg finds this by accident, and and this seems to happen a lot. Often it's looking at trial records. Um, I I think uh, Natalie Zeman Davis. A similar thing happens. She's looking at trial records. Um, her, her, the the return of Martin Gare is a, a better known story. Um, so I'm not sure how accidental that was, but in my case, um, I was trying to reconstruct the weather of the Tibetan plateau, or at least eastern Tibet, during the 19. 30s and 40s. I'm an environmental historian, um, and so I, I wanted to know, you know, what was the temperature? Um, temperature has the, in fact, the temperature has um, obviously increased over time um, because of global warming. And so, what were, what were temperatures like um, in the 1930s and 40s, and how did that impact agri agriculture and other enterprises? And that that's really, you know, pretty boring stuff to most people. But in the process of doing that. Um, I came across a lot of um, missing weather data and attached to the blank charts or in places where data should have been um, were letters from meteorologists to their supervisors. Now, this is a really interesting case because, um, for one thing, these meteorologists are ethnically Chinese or Han Chinese people working on the frontier. Um, in a, a mostly eth ethnically Tibetan location. Um, and so I, I, I wondered, what is their experience of the landscape? Um, secondly, these are people who are not particularly important, um, and yet they're highly, they're, they're literate and they produce documents because that's their job. They're weather observers. They have to write things down. And so it was a rare window into how um, sub-elite we could say maybe ordinary um, Chinese people experience the frontier. And it gives us a very different picture than the accounts of more elite Chinese observers on the frontier, most of whom find the frontier exciting and exotic and in some ways pleasurable. These non-elite observers um, tended to find the frontier to be boring and lonely and miserable and possibly uh, life destroying. They're, you know, a couple of people describe it as life on the frontier as having ruined their lives. Um, and so um, I, yeah, I just kind of worked with sources that I, I found by chance and pursued those sources through the archives um, and came out with what I don't think is going to be mo <laughs> my most widely read um, publication, but it's my favorite that I've written. <clears throat> yes, thank you um, for the comments, Nora, and for the questions. There are so many threads there, um, uh, interesting threads. But I could speak a little bit about uh, the methodology, the methods, because I, I think we ended there. That, um, and I, yeah, when it comes to the film of The Stranger, Stranger, for me, I'm, I'm very um, marked or influenced by this conceptual tradition that every artwork itself has its own methodology. And also that you have to invent your own methodology for each work, and they could be very different. Um, but there should be some kind of resonance between the methodology and the work itself. So in this work, the background is, I, I know this person for, for 20 years, uh, um, and <clears throat> I heard his stories over the years. 
So, so the person, uh, Johnny Walker, he's, he's an extremely interesting storyteller. Um, but I also hear that he changes the story all the time. And, and so they are floating around. But in this work, I had this idea that I really wanted to actually know what was true about all these stories he, he produced. Um, so it was in a way, I also used the idea of, of some kind of historical truthness in this work. So I interviewed people around him and I interviewed um, also people knowledgeable about the use in, in, in Japan, uh, even scholars. Um, and from that point, I wrote the manuscript so in, in my works, it's very much about the moment of writing, which is guiding how the, the work is done. So in the film, there are people speaking as if they were interviewed, but they are actually reading my manuscript. So I used their, um, I mean, they had to agree with, with the manuscript, but they're actually reading the manuscript. Um, in that case, I control the narrative of, of the story. And I think that part is, for me, extremely interesting, um, the idea of writing and writing history. And, and I would have turned that question that you had a little bit before, Nora, how artists work with history. But I would also say that historians work with art in a way, because historians, they write. And writing is, is to exclude, mostly. It's a very little piece of writing that is including. It's almost about excluding. I mean, that's a major work you do. Um, and if we look at the present and the past, it's chaotic, of course. It's psychotic. So what you write is a very tiny fraction of reality, which means you have to, to compose something. And in that sense, every historian is a writer. Every historian is a creative person. Um, um, and um, Carlo Ginsberg speaks a lot about this um, when we met him. He speaks about the literary quality of, of history writing. He's very close to lit literature himself. His mother was Natalia Ginsberg. She was a very famous writer working with Pasolini and Italo Calvino in the NYD uh, publishing company. So he's very, he's very influenced by, by this tradition of writing. And, and, he, he is very open with this idea of, of the historian as a writer. So that also creates a common ground for, for, for two creative fields, the visual arts and the creative writer. Um, and of course, there's been a large discussion within historiography about um, the idea that writing history is actually creating fiction. Not that history is fiction, but the very moment of writing always create fiction. There's always a beginning and the middle and the end. So there's a plot. Um, yeah. Maybe Mark recognized this. Yeah. Or both of you as, as, yeah. also, as art historians. Absolutely. I, I think about that often when I uh, interview artists and or I, I speak with artists and exchange thoughts and, and visit their studios that the process of making art and the process of writing anything is the same. You know, so I, I agree with you. And I often think about that, even though I wouldn't call scholarship art necessarily, but I, I understand the process of, of trying to work out, work through something, uh, work through ideas um, to try to make sense of something that impressed you or intrigued you. Um, asking questions about something and then trying to figure out how to answer them. This is scholarship and it's art making. So I think, uh, and you know, and it's also making visible. I think one of you were talking about, I think um, Magnus about the tangible and the intangible. I think that we're trying to make tangible, you know, uh, or visible. I think artists are trying to make visible things that are not apparent. And uh, so I think that that's where scholarship and, and art making come together as well. Now, I would love to talk to you both, but I have um, 
and I have the privilege of the good fortune of having dinner with Magnus in a little bit. Mark, unfortunately, won't be with us. So I'd like to turn the questions to the audience so that I don't monopolize the conversation. So um, first question is from Taiha. A question for Mark. Uh, could you tell us more about your research? Although it sounds like I asked a little bit about method, but you could you could talk a bit more um, why you started working with the weather stations and what larger conclusions did you draw from that micro history study? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I, I did talk about this a little bit earlier in response to, to your question, Nora. Um, so I, I won't um, take up too much time, but um, I, I guess I my conclusion was that uh, when historians write about um, empire and its attitude towards frontiers, um, oftentimes we look at state perspectives uh, or elite perspectives because those are the ones that are re readily available. Um, but when we look at non-elite perspectives, such as you know the perspective of a weather observer on the frontier, um, we might get a very different picture. Um, so in, as I said, in my case, these weather observers uh, tended to be miserable and not not enthusiastic about about their work, um, and and for that matter, not not terribly patriotic or um, interested in in state expansion. Um, but um, it I I drew inspiration from uh, there's a, a book that I love called Imperial Boredom, about very bored British officials in um, in I think India and Africa um, during the 19th century, um, and you know again just fascinating to think about, but um, I also want to just talk briefly about the the visualization process in this work. Um, so I guess what I was trying to do was to, since these are, you know, there are no visual materials um, or no good visual materials for what I was writing about, um, trying to work with an illustrator, uh, Lodan Rojas, to turn text into visuals. And so I guess um, I, I wonder if um, I, I do recognize that, you know, the field of, art history has been working with visual materials for a very long time. And I, I didn't mean to elide that. Um, but I, I wonder if the difference is that um, art, that historians like me who are not art historians um, tend to focus on turning text into visuals um, and don't think very, we don't tend to think very much about other alternatives um, than art historians in my sort of superficial impression tend to turn visual materials into text that is accom accompanied by the visuals that they're working with. Um, and then what Magnus is talking about in terms of the art uh, of artists sounds to me like it's people working with visual source materials and producing visual materials. And I, I wonder if that typology, you know, text to visual, visual to text, visual to visual um, is meaningful to, to you, Nora and Magnus, or whether that's just sort of my, um, misinterpretation of, of how we might be working differently. And then if, if we are working differently in that way, whether there are ways that we could work together better, um, you, you know, but, but anyway, I, I, you know, I, I think that Magnus has already answered a lot of that with, uh, with his presentation, which I really appreciate. Yeah, we'll have a, let's have a conversation sometime. Uh, uh, offline, I, I, I like that idea. Um, let me move on to Vin Kin's question. This is a question for Magnus. Since you talked briefly about Alexander the Great, I wanted to ask about fiction and history. There's currently an exhibition at the British Library about Alexander and how his life was so wrapped up in fictions and myths of others and his own making that there's no truth uh, to get at, uh, get, at, get at all. Sorry, um, I'm just reading from the question. Do you think that this is true for most or all uh, macro histories or histories from above? Does this mean that micro history is therefore further from fiction and closer to quote unquote fact? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, but I mean, I guess Alexander the Great is a good example of, of how uh, myths and facts and fiction are blended together. But um, there are 
I think there are some problems with the terms maybe here also that a text uh, as for instance the historian there's a quite famous uh, discussion from an American historian called Hayden White and Hayden White's idea is that historians always are making fiction and that was what I mentioned before when I said that historians is maybe also an artist and Hayden White's idea is okay it's not for sure historical artifacts they are facts for instance things have happened in history which we couldn't uh, which we always can try to to prove but once we started to write history we are actually entering the realm of fiction by language, using language so any account on, on historical events would be branded as fiction by Hyde and White, for instance. It's a very provocative, but also very interesting idea that that the very act of writing creates fiction from from the beginning. So, so when we look at those historical records, we have to th the same discussion. Maybe would be possible to have around documentary, for instance. And and. Uh, in that sense, if we compare the same discussion with the documentary practice, there is no documentary. Um, there is only fiction in that sense also, because it has to do with organizing um, a sequence of events. And as filmmakers, we know that the way you organize this will totally... Um, the, the very order of sequences will 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 guide the emotions, um, and in that sense, you can own, you can create totally different stories by just ordering material in a different ways. So, I don't know if that answers the question at all, but but I think I would also subscribe to the idea that we are in the same field, artists and historians, when we write or narrate. Or, or, or visualize history. Yeah, we are all partaking in a con construct, you know, in a yeah. constructing a narrative, and and uh, that I don't know if that's the definition of fiction, but I I, I read also Hayden White, and I know that it, it 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 really brought to light this idea that we are you know history is just writing. It's not. It's not the the reality that happened. It's not the event. It's it's the writing of it. Therefore, it's constructed. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's another question uh, from Net uh, Net Bo, uh, Bo. Um, Just wondering, artists today often use research on different micro histories to make art that shines light on marginalized or minor communities, cultures, rituals, etc. To ensure that such stories and information are heard, documented, or circulated. In places like Vietnam, this could bring about undesirable consequences, possibly even the erasure of such microhistories. What would be an appropriate ethical or moral parameter for artists and researchers that could be put in place when faced with such cases like this? Either of you want to answer that? So that's, I mean, that brings about, I'll let you think about it to answer it, but it brings about this interesting question relates to what we were just talking about. Then the right, the mere writing of something is actually bringing to, it to light and bringing it out and uh, making it visible. But then if it's, if it's a controversial history or it's something, then it, what does that do? What's the impact of that? And, and will it, be erased while as if you hadn't brought it out it would remain <laughs> very philosophical question yeah thank you i mean uh, nora i'd be interested in hearing your perspective on that as a vietnam art historian i'll just say that my very briefly my i'm not an artist but my experience with um people producing art and history of ethnic minorities in east asia and particularly china often what happens is that the audience becomes people outside of China. Um, 
they're they're people who write for say uh, an international or an American audience, but their their work is not viewed or written within China. And I, I do have doubts about how effective that is, or whether it's just polarizing. Um, it's really tricky to navigate, uh, you know, na- navigate ethnic minority politics and art. Yeah, um, I, I would also like to hear your, your opinion then or, um, or your view. But I, from my understanding or my perspective is that no one can give a voice to another person. Um, and it's always the narrator's voice. Uh, and, and it's not that one story is told for once and ever. It, story will always change, the history will always change, or the narration will always change with the person. So, um, and I'm not really 100% sure about the question of the ratio here, um, but maybe there was something I missed in, in the questions. But uh, please, Nora, comment. Yeah, well, I think that the person who asked the question is alluding to possibility because in Vietnam of course um, there are many micro histories that are not uh, told you know that that need need to be told because there's a strong nationalist bent or ideological bent in certain ways of telling histories in school books or what is published what is available in bookstores and etc um, I'm not, but there are also stories of individuals that um, I think both of you brought up, um, you know, something like uh, um, an, an incident that speaks of a, you know, the whole, a, a particular event that then sheds light on a, on a bigger history or sh- changes the course of history. I think you said that, Mark. Um, there are a lot of those such stories in uh, in Vietnam, of course. Um, and but the the questioner might be saying that there's a danger, or there is a a danger in doing it for fear of possibly censorship. But there's also a moral, perhaps obligation, not obligation, but maybe some people feel compelled to speak of those specifically because they otherwise would be erased. But they run a risk in doing that because they run a risk of maybe causing further erasure, such as a ban, and then causing censorship. So um, there might be a follow-up. Yeah, someone is following up, actually. So I'll read that. Follow-up on Yet's question. I would like to ask about the method of composing and presenting microhistory research, where at one point we'll reach a conflicting tension with existing macro histories in circulation, taking into account such encounters between contested narratives, and what are your suggestions on this on this ne- uh, dynamic? And the question with accounts of graphic novels, examples provided by Mark, is that in order for such publications to be articulated, there's also a system or process of going through different parties, such as publishers and potential audiences, or in the case of the arts, there are also interests from galleries, collectors, organizations who decide on what artwork to be displayed to the audience. With such caution in mind, how can we treat personal accounts, visual archives, microhistory presentations without or minimal biases? So that's um, yet kind of elaborating on that. And um, so I don't know if you have a response to, to, to that. And... I also have some ideas uh, because I think that there's a this is a pretty loaded you know question it has or touches on a, a variety of issues. So I don't know if you want to respond to some of those elements. Um, I I can go ahead. Um, yeah. So in the case of the, I'll, I'll use the example of the Oxford University Press's 
graphic history series. Uh, and in some ways, I think it's really innovative. Uh, it's not, these aren't the first graphic histories, but it's the first time a major academic press has created a whole series of illustrated histories that are based on original research, I think. Um, but the, if I'm looking at this from an art perspective, I, I, I'm probably thinking that the problem is that the art is clearly secondary to the the textual research, the textual sources and um, write up. And in fact, um, you can you can check the idea with these the series is that of about half of the book is primary sources that have been directly included in the text. And so you can kind of check the um, graphic part of the book against those written primary sources as well as source photographs and uh you know the the reader can then verify whether these things have been faithfully reproduced and so art here is a visual aid it's it's illustration but it's not it's not the kind of art that you know we've, we've seen today in for example from um magnus's group um and so um yeah, I, I guess. Uh, okay, so I, I have a question actually on this on this note for for Magnus and maybe for Nora and Pamela as well, which is um, the the relationship between artists, tr traditional artists, and I'm sorry, traditional historians and artists doesn't seem all that um, well developed to me. Um, looking at this as a, a boring, you know, um, cultural environmental historian, but um, I've seen really uh, path-breaking work by anthropologists who do visual work. And um, so there, there's a whole field of visual anthropology. Um, and so, you know, my, my friend Benny Schaefer um, was writing his Harvard dissertation on um, sort of marginalized communities in China. And he does his work, his ethnography, as film. And so he has one film that's about a theme park that's entirely um, staffed by uh, by um, people with, um, uh, I guess, a dwarf syndrome, um, and another one that's about a tightrope walker. Um, but these are all sort of pe people on the margins of society. And he does his research and produces the output entirely in a visual format. He's not writing up a, a conventional PhD thesis. And so I wonder, like, why, why history? Is there um, a difference between m artistic microhistory and visual anthropology um, that I'm not seeing? Or is this another way of saying, you know, something like visual anthropology? Um, I'm wondering, Magnus, if you've uh, engaged anthropologists very much and what that has been like. Um, <clears throat> well, I am... Um... I would insist that, uh, for instance, Carl Ginsberg is an um, artistic um, historian, <laughs> microhistorian. And since I, I, you know, what I mentioned about him as very close to literature. So, so, but for sure, uh, visual uh, ethnog ethnography is, is a very strong uh, field and also, um, in a way, overlapping field. Uh, not least to, to the genre we work with in our product, uh, video essay. Um, and in that field, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but, and, and I guess um, um, Pamela can say more, um, but I know there's a practice here also at, at Fulbright University um, where you see this overlapping field, uh, visual anthropology, uh, visual and ethnography, and, and video art, or film, film practice. And I think it's a very fruitful and, 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 and developing area as well. Maybe Pamela wanna comment on that. Um, yeah, it's actually our colleague at Fulbright University of Vietnam, Trâm Lung, who should be the one to comment on this. She is a, a visual anthropologist and an artist and filmmaker. Um, but I think there's actually a rich tradition of artists in Vietnam who are filmmakers and theorists uh, who engage with ethnography and ethnographic filmmaking and also subvert it and critique it. Um, you know, Trinti Minha, for example, uh, Nguyen Trinti as well. So we actually have quite a rich tradition of this in Vietnam. I don't know if you want to add to that, Nora. Uh, 
Uh, yes, well, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Fan Tang Ren's work actually is very different. So I'd say there is actually a little bit of a different. The, the, the artists that you mentioned are more visual anthropologists, I would say, ethnographic filmmakers than the artists. I would say, you know, um, artists maybe take certain formal liberties more than visual anthropologists. So there's a, there's a little bit of difference in intent and audiences too. So there is a difference. Um, now, I would like to uh, allow uh, the, our last question to be asked. So I'll, I'll read off the last question because we're running out of time almost. And again, these are these are uh, fantastic questions that I'm sure that we can go on at length. But there's a last question from uh, Hannah Zeleke Collin who says, a question for all, is there a value in micro stories that is not related uh, to understand or see the bigger picture? except from for the individual working with some story. So I don't know if you want to um, answer, attempt to answer that question. Maybe if you would like me to, to um, paraphrase what I understand is this, I guess it's this, yeah, is there a value to micro history that is not uh, necessarily related to the bigger picture, maybe a smaller picture. <laughs> yeah, I could maybe say something. I mean, this is actually a quite common question, I would say. Um, and, and maybe here there is a difference between historians and artists in a way. That <clears throat> also maybe within our group, we had a some disagreements around this topic, actually. Um, it was, for instance, Susanna Milevska, the creator from, from Skopje, she always you know, pro, uh, promoted the idea that one has to see the link between the micro and the macro. You know, it's only meaningful if we understand how this small course is event or how these details could be connected to something larger. Whereas some of us artists, we, we claim well, actually, we don't have to know that. Um, small story, small fragment, we have to go by intuition here as artists. We, maybe we don't know exactly the connection to the larger courses of events, but maybe we feel it somehow. Maybe we can sense it, but we could maybe not always explain it. Um, so we stood a little bit on different sides here, and we said maybe as artists, there is no story that is too small, in a way. Um, and, and, and we don't need to see the large, you know, maybe we, we can't see the whole connection to the largest history. So, in a way, you can put it in maybe in a little bit banal way and say, a good story is a good story <laughs> for, for an artist. I don't know if you want to add a last word, Mark. Otherwise, we're right on time at 7.30. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to add, just that I think that's true. And I, I think that art does things that conventional academic history cannot in making you maybe feel and um, experience things in a nonverbal way. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. Looking at some of Magnus's films and our projects online, um, you know, I, I watched one that was a video about, um, and well, it's called Biography, about teasing somebody in school. And um, it was extremely thought provoking. And, and I, I can't verbalize the impression that it had on me quite yet, but, um, but I love it. So I, I won't add, I won't say any more than that. Um, oh, I have to, I'll have to watch that. Uh, I'll ask you for the reference. Okay. Well, thank you uh, both, uh, and these, and and thank you to the audience for such provocative, thought-provoking questions. And uh, and it seems like we haven't even begun to touch the or or reach the the depths of this question of microhistory. But we have two more days to do so um, with the program on. Uh, tomorrow and or Saturday, sorry, and Sunday. 
Pamela, I, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, but thank you both. And thank you for organizing this. This has been fantastic. Yes, so we will have a film screening at Fulbright on Saturday. Um, unfortunately, registration for this program is closed. <laughs> um, but we also have, yes, we also have a workshop on Sunday and that is for students and artists. But again, the registration for that one is closed as well. Um, but it's nice to have these different kinds of events to explore these topics and questions uh, in more depth. So on that note, I, I want to give thanks to the Nguyen Art Foundation for helping to support this discussion for and for hosting this webinar. Thank you so much. And um, perhaps, Bill, I don't know if you want to add anything about how this might be archived, um, whether this will be archived. Mm. Uh, the public chat is, has been uh, recorded by Facebook itself and will be available to view from now on uh, on our Facebook channel. Uh, we will all also subtitle uh, the talk and at some point we will publish the Vietnamese version online for everyone to take a look at. Okay, so, yeah. terrific. Thank you so much. So thank you to our speakers and thank you to Nguyen Art Foundation, uh, Stint, the Stint Grant at Kunstwerk and uh, Fulbright University of Vietnam. And so on that note, um, have a good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank so you, everyone. Thank you.